and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you're a God that does break every chain. Oh, Lord God, that's why you died on the cross. Oh, Lord God, to free us. Lord God, from the things that once bound us. But Lord, we are free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Now we ask that you free us up, free our minds, oh Lord God, and give us understanding so that, Lord, we can hear and understand what you want to talk to us about today from your word, Lord Jesus. God, we pray, Father, that you would anoint your word, oh Lord God, and that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church of God said, Amen. Amen. You got some more praise in you? Let's give it up for Jesus right now. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Amen. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. Uh, I just want to just, uh, just expound a little bit on the week of prayer. January 2nd, as Brother Wade mentioned, um, we start... Uh, 10-day fast is from Wednesday, January 2nd to Friday, January 11th. That's 10 days um, to significantly stop doing something, usually eating something that you would normally eat so you can concentrate on getting close to God. Um, we are, if we have your email address, we'll send you some literature uh, that I wrote about fasting to give you some ideas of what uh, that is, and uh, that's a significant time that, that week. We're going to be here Monday to bring in the new year, and then Wednesday to pray, and then Friday we're going to pray for every single person that comes individually. We're going to pray over everybody, and we're going to start the year right in the presence of God. How many say amen? amen. But we want to make sure that you know uh, what we're doing so that we can fast together as a church. It's so important. Uh, why that's uh, uh, so important to, uh, to know about. And I hope, you know, you, you, you fast something greater than ice cream, okay? <laughs> Somebody says, I'm going to fast Jimmy Cone. Jimmy Cone is closed for wintertime, so you don't have to fast that. But we're going to give you something to, to help you with that so that we can all be on the same page. At this moment, I'm going to uh, ask the children to start making their way to their children's church so that they can learn about Jesus in their own environment. Amen. Well, as I was uh, seeking the Lord and uh, asking the Lord what uh, he wanted to put on my heart, I was thinking about um, things that change. You know, there used to be a program on television. I'm not sure if it's on anymore. It's called Extreme Makeover. You know, have you all seen that show? You know what it's about. It's uh, someone who, uh, it's a team of people, they, obviously they did it for the program, but they would choose um, a family uh, that I guess people would write in letters recommending families, and they would check them out, and they were looking for uh, people that were living in bad conditions with their home, and they didn't have the resources to fix it up, and you know they had problems in the home, and what they would do is they would come in, and they would send the family on a seven-day vacation. And during that seven-day vacation, a, a team of workers like ants would come in and totally transform the, the home. So that when the family came back and they're filming this, uh, they, they walk in, they walk into a totally new transformed home. You, you couldn't even recognize that it was the same house. Amen? Anybody ever seen that? Anybody ever daydreamed that they would come to your house? <laughs> I got some projects for them I'd like them to look at. But just uh, recently, uh, you know, we had a problem with mold in our bathroom, and uh, we found out uh, that we had to obviously get rid of that, but we didn't know. So we, we, what we did, well, my wife, uh, you know, she had had enough, and she had the boys just tear everything off that had mold on it. So if you can imagine, 
after they were done because uh, my boys are very talented at destroying things. I taught them myself. And uh, they have that gift. If you need anything destroyed, I recommend my two sons. And when they had done, finished, it looked like something out of the nightmare on Elm Street. It was horrible. There was paint hanging. It was just, and the walls were just terrible. So I went in and I, I stripped off the, the stuff that was hanging so, you know, it could be at least somewhat presentable. But uh, two weeks ago, uh, someone came in who was very good at that, a couple of guys, and they were in there for a day and a half, and when they were done, it was totally transformed. Brand spanking new. It didn't look like the same bathroom, and we were thankful for that. There was a total transformation. I want to talk to you about transformation, because the Bible talks about transformation. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is revelation that leads to transformation. How many say amen? amen. First, your eyes are open to the fact that you need to be transformed because before you knew that, you were kind of just moving along and doing your own thing and living life and surviving, and uh, that's what we do. But then one day, you were awakened to the fact that there's more to life than just what you're doing and just this life here on earth. It's called a revelation. God opens your eyes, and then you uh, realize that you need a Savior, that Jesus came for a reason. And that starts the transformation process. Once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, the transformation begins. And that first step is so crucial because... It's what everything else is built on. In other words, before, you were operating according to the system of the world, the way the world thinks and the way the world does things. And, you know, you got to do whatever you can to survive and look out for number one, numero uno, and all of these things, you know, all of these phrases that they teach you, you know, just do it, um, you know, have it your way, all these things. And all of a sudden, your eyes are open. And now there's a different system, a different foundation, and it's night and day different than what you were doing. And all of a sudden, like the ground under you has come out and you have something brand new to stand on. It's quite shocking. At the beginning, you can see when someone's coming from, that, uh, from outside into the light of the gospel, it's, it's an amazing event. But it's not supposed to just stay there. In other words, there's supposed to be growth after that. And it's obvious as we look around, because sometimes the chains that uh, uh, Jesus already broke, how many know Jesus came to break the power of sin in our lives? How many know that's what he did? So the power of sin is broken, but we remain with chains on that we shouldn't have on because we have not been transforming the way that we're supposed to and the way the Bible talks about. It's obvious that some have problems with the transformation process. So I want to take a the look at some of the things we need to know that will help us to be transformed as we are supposed to be. No matter who you are, no matter who you think of some great preacher that you have seen on TV, no one is finished yet. How many of you are finished? We are all a work in progress. How many say amen? amen. And anything that is healthy is growing. I was saying to, to some of the folks yesterday we had, we were talking to the folks that help us all around the church, those that are our team members and uh, who do all kinds of things here. We were just encouraging each other. And, um, you know, people say that, uh, you know, you stop growing at, is it 21 or 25? I don't know what it is. But you don't stop growing at uh, 25, right? Because everybody here is still growing. How many here are growing older? Right? 
There's a process. Your body's always going through transformation. Cells are being renewed. Stuff is happening in your body. It never stops. So I wanted to look at what the Bible says about transformation. First of all, you have to know that transformation is required. As a Christian, once you receive Christ as your Savior, that's great. But you can't stay there. You can't. Because there's a requirement that Jesus has. And it's a requirement towards transformation. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we read the following. In fact, let's read that together. Would you read with me? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we see that it says, could you put it back up there, please, before that? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That is a command to you and me. Be transformed. If I went and mentioned each of you by name, I would say, uh, Joey, the Bible says, be transformed. Matt? Be transformed. James, be transformed. Andrew, be transformed. So it's a command that God gives us. And then it gets a little bit more uh, serious when we hear the words of Jesus that he spoke to about the transformation process. Matthew chapter 7, verses 19 and 20 says the following. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. In other words, uh, if, if you have had an experience with the Lord, that initial experience that you had will come along with some evidence. Uh, we were meeting with the young adults uh, uh, two Fridays ago, and we opened it up to questions and answers, and they had some really good questions. And one of the questions that was asked was, how do I know or how does someone know if they are in fact saved? Well, the answer is that if you have been saved, you have been changed. In other words, if you raise your hand somewhere and then you went on with your life as usual and nothing changed, then you didn't, you had a moment, but you didn't have a, a salvation experience. Because when you have a salvation experience, right then and there, there is a, a, an initial transformation, there's a change. The Bible says you go from light, from the darkness into the light. It says that the old person has passed away and a new person uh, appears, right? Now, that sounds strange if you've never heard of that, but how many here were once one way before you met Christ? You met Christ and, to and, and God totally changed you. Raise your hand if that's what your testimony is. You know, I come from Brooklyn, New York, and there are some characters in Brooklyn, New York. New York, and uh, the church that I came from, it grew from a very, very small church, uh, smaller than this one, uh, wh where we started, and now it's a, a, a huge church where a lot of people, and there are so many people in there that I can pick out to you that if you knew them before they received Christ, you would not want to know them. They were not people that you wanted to be around, rough characters. But all of a sudden, there was a transformation, a change in their life. So it's evidence of your experience. So transformation is required. It's not just for some. It's what we're supposed to be doing. It's what's supposed to be happening. Secondly, transformation is a process. It doesn't happen in all in one fell swoop, Right? How many are still learning and growing as you go? It, it's a process. It's an ongoing process. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says this. So all of us who have had that veil removed, meaning before we couldn't see. If you have a veil over your eyes, you can't see well. 
All of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So more and more and more, we're supposed to be looking like Jesus. More and more, we're supposed to go from glory to more glory to more glory. It's a wonderful process of learning. And one of the things you learned, you know, you learn as you go in life. I was talking to the folks today who were coming in as we were praying together, is that uh, you need that process. How many are still working on it? Uh, just raise your hand if you're still working on it. I, I was talking about, I was driving this morning, and, um, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I grew up driving on the streets of New York. So you, you learn to zip in and out, not use your signal, because you know in New York, if you use your signal, people won't let you in. You got to sneak in to the lane, because if you put the signal on, that's their signal, they're not letting you in. That's just a fact of life. You got to sneak in. And you can get so good that you can sneak in on a taxi cab, and now you've graduated. If you can sneak in on a taxi cab, boy, you're good. But so, so here I am. I, I was running some errands uh, early this morning. My wife sends me on a honeydew list on Sunday morning before I come here. And as I was coming back, there was a green light, and I love to catch the green lights. You know, I'll tell you a little secret. You know, when, when uh, we were changing insurances, and they said, you know, if you put this device in your car um, and you keep it on for three months, depending on how you drive, you, you can get lowered, I think, 30% or something like that. And I said, no, thank you. Can you guess why I said no thank you? Because I see that green light. I want to hit that gas. And that's what that thing is measuring. I want to get the light. Why? Am I late? Am I in a hurry? No. But it's just me. So I get to the light. And there's a car there. Um, and he's waiting for to be able to make a left turn. There's oncoming traffic. And, but he's not going forward. In other words, he's behind the crosswalk. And you know what that means. If he doesn't go forward and the light turns red, I have to wait another cycle. Yeah. So, you know, as he was there and I get to the light, you know, and, uh, you know, I had my prayer time this morning. I get to him and, oh, come on. Come on, dude. Right? And all of a sudden I caught myself. Why? What am I in a hurry to do? I have all the time in the world. It's early, super early in the morning. Uh, I, I, I don't know. But how many love to wait behind cars? Are, do you like to wait? Are you strange? How is it here in Maryland? Is it different or is it just me? And I was talking about, you ever go, you know, how many know Woodfield Road? Raise your hand if you've ever been on Woodfield Road. There's a sweet spot on Woodfield Road where it goes from 30, right? And that's death to me. 30 is death. And then... And then, then it goes up to 40, and I get a little happier, right? All right, 40. You know, maybe you could push it, you know, a little bit. And then there's that sweet spot that it goes 50 for like a couple of miles. And I can't wait to get to that spot. Yes, here's 50, right? And sometimes you get to that 50-mile-an-hour spot, and there's a car in front of him. He's going 30 the whole time, wasting that stretch that I was waiting for. You feel my pain. That, that just shows me, right? And you, you have all you can do, right, to, you know, sometimes I, I wish that the 50 mile an hour was flashing, you know, I'm hoping, here, they're going to pass a sign that says 50. Maybe they didn't see it. Maybe they didn't see it. And so they pass the sign, and they're still driving 30. And so what that shows me is my flesh is still kicking, right? I, you know, the Bible says crucify yourself or crucify your flesh every day, right? So I thought I did, you know, until I got on Woodfield Road. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process, right? And thank God that he's patient with us. How many say amen? amen. Trans, uh, transformation can also be interrupted or snuffed out. And that's what we have to avoid. We don't want the transformation to be interrupted or snuffed out. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, Jesus 
talking about the different kinds of seed, which seed being the gospel that changes us, the word of God. It says this, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. That means that someone had the word, you got saved, but something happened, and now the process has stopped. You know, when, if you've ever been choked, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, you, you can't get out, you struggle to get out, and if the chokehold is laid long enough, you will start to pass out. Right? And if they hold it longer than you passing out, then you will be snuffed out. Yeah. Right? So imagine what is it that snuffs out or chokes our transformation? The worries and the cares of life, the pleasures of life. In other words, you get distracted. It could be that you uh, got this idea that you were going to make a lot of money. The Bible says, be careful about trying to make Money, because many people have been have wrecked their lives trying to do that. Uh, it could be a person, a wrong person that you got involved with. It could be a, 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 just a something that took your eyes off of Jesus. And all of a sudden, you stop being transformed. And let me tell you something. When you stop being transformed, it's not pretty. Because what happens is you start going backwards, actually, and reverting back to the form that you were before Christ transformed you. I I happen to know people that were sitting next to me praising God with arms outraised that got the word choked and so slipped back that today I do not recognize them. They deny the very God that they once served. That's our condition. I hope you know that. Don't ever think or say, oh, I'll never do this or I'll never do that. Say, by the grace of God, him keeping me, I won't do that. But left to my own devices, I am capable of doing anything. Amen? Amen. So transformation can be choked out. We need to be alert. You know, uh, the the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, uh, they were the first team uh, of, of uh, two men who, who God called out to preach to the Gentiles. And Barnabas had a cousin named Mark, John Mark. And in Acts, in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 15, it talks about Mark left them mid-trip. He just booked. And I'm thinking the word, something got distracted. And later on, They're going on another trip, and Barnabas wanted to take Mark again, and Paul said, "Uh uh-uh, I want to take Mark, because this is all in the Word of God. So the last time he went, he punked out on us. That's what the... (laughs) That's the the JLV version. And and, uh, so I don't want to take him, but later on, thank God, he was restored, and he was the one who wrote the book of Mark, and uh, Paul even... They got reconciled, and he asked for Mark at some point. He says, he's very useful to me. How many thank God that sometimes when we slip up or we get choked out, that God rescues us and brings us back and doesn't disqualify us? Amen. So transformation, you have to be careful. It can be choked out. I want you to know also that transformation will continue until... We see Jesus. And we're not going to, well, listen to what Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He that began a good work in you, that work at the very beginning is so crucial. And it's a good work. And Jesus promises that the one, him, who started the work in you, he doesn't leave things halfway. As a matter of fact, if you wouldn't move, you would be transformed a lot quicker 
than you possibly may be at the moment. It's not that he stops the work. It's just that the work gets up and walks away sometimes. Right? Sometimes you just get up and, and think you're going to do something else. And that delays the process. But according to Jesus, he gonna, he's, gonna, he's faithful to continue to work until you, we reach completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What's the day of Jesus Christ? When he comes back for us or until we go see him. Then we'll be finally complete. First John chapter 3, verse 2 says this, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Did you know that the transformation process is you and me becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what it is. And the more and more that you become like Jesus, the more peace that you have, the more joy that you have, the more satisfaction in this life that you have, the more alive you feel than ever before, the more of a blessing you can be to your family and to everybody else around you, the more blessings that you can walk in, the more victory that you can have, even when things come against you, nothing can stop you when you become more and more like Jesus. Why? Because nothing can stop Jesus, and Jesus lives in me and you, and the more that he lives in me and you, the less things that come against us will have any effect on our lives. That's why it's so crucial. That's why the Bible says you are more than conquerors. Let me tell you, I am not more than a conqueror by myself. But with Christ in me, with me stepping out of the way and laying down that old person and that flesh, then all of a sudden I see that I am conquering things that I can't normally conquer. And I can do things that I couldn't normally do. Because greater is he that is in me and you than he that is in the world. So nothing can come against us. That's why transformation is so crucial. The, 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 the transformation is for you and me. You know, we, we think we're doing sometimes God a favor. No, he loves us and he wants to transform us because what we were before, ugh. I, I, I mean, anybody who's honest with yourself, right? What we do when no one is looking that's who we are. And I know that no one here wants to tell somebody else their deepest, darkest secrets, right? We're all very quiet now. Thinking, I hope he doesn't pick on me. <laughs> Listen, I want to pick on myself because I'm in the same boat. There's stuff that just, we know who we are, don't we? I mean, we, we try to present ourselves, but thank God that he transforms us and changes us into a new creation. That's what the Bible says. I love that. I love that the old has passed away. It's dead and buried. That's what baptism is, is so wonderful to me. As you go down into the waters of baptism, you are signifying that guy is gone. And then you resurrect, and you are a brand new person. And if you know somebody that was a character before, and they received Christ, it is a brand new person. How many know people like that? How many, that person was you? <laughs> Praise God. Here's the next thing you need to know. Transformation is intentional. Okay? I know that... God does work in us, but transformational, transformation is intentional on your part and my part. The initial change as we receive Christ comes from Christ, but then there are things that we need to do, that if we, and we need to be intentional about it. If we're not, we won't be transformed. Number one, transformation requires surrender. You have to surrender your life. 
You have to surrender what you want. You have to surrender your will. Those are things that are very difficult for us. If you had plans and you had a five-year, ten-year plan before you accepted Christ, I, probably you're not going to have that same plan. Probably that plan is not what God has for you. I'm just guessing. As I see uh, God do things in people. What, what I'm doing now was not in my plan. I wanted to work on Wall Street, and I did. I wanted to be a business person, and I was for a while. I didn't have plans to be in the ministry. As a matter of fact, I did not want to be in ministry. But here I am because I had to give up my plan, which, by the way, was sending me down the wrong way, okay? I was not doing well with my plan. I was doing well financially, but inside, I was rotting away, you see. That was my plan. And even though I was getting the success that the world says you should have, and I was, uh, you know, accumulating some toys that I, that, I, that I liked, it was the worst condition of my soul. So then I had to give up my plan to be saved by Christ, and then I took on his plan and found myself doing things that I never dreamed or thought that I would do. And guess what? No regrets. No regrets whatsoever. God's plan for you and me is better than anything you can dream of or think of. What the world offers is false It's a mirage. You get there where you say they need to get, and then you find out it's nowhere. Just look at Hollywood. That's all I have to say. Look at the people who've made it. They are so messed up. They're the ones that need all the the treatment and all of that. They can't stay married for three months. They are messed up people, but they are the ones that have what the world system says that you should have so that you can be happy. Are they happy? No. No, they're not. Why? Because we can't be happy with anything. We were made for a relationship with God, and that relationship comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have everything. You can be a billionaire just this year, Uh, tragically, two billionaires. One lady was a designer, a billionaire with a little girl and a husband, and she killed herself. What what is it? She could have had, think about it. What can you do with a billion dollars? What can you not have? You can't even spend a billion dollars. It's too much money. You can buy houses everywhere. You can have all kinds of cars. You can travel anywhere you want. You can own your own airplane. What would drive her to kill herself? Because it's nothing. It's paper. And and it can't buy what the soul requires. You know what your soul needs? It needs love. Where does love come from? Pure love comes from God. God is love. That's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4. You have everything in the world. You don't have God's love. You have nothing. It's empty, 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 empty. God wants to fill you, and that takes transformation. And the more you're transformed, the more of the Holy Spirit you have in you, the more of God you have in you, the more of Jesus you have in you, you look more like Jesus than ever before. And that's the best state that you can be here walking on this earth until we see him again. And when we get to heaven, that's a different story. That's, you know, talk about the Bible says that in God's presence there is fullness of of joy. You ever think about that for a second? Fullness of joy. You ever been joyful for a little bit? Right? Just for a little bit. It feels so good to be very joyful, but it doesn't last because something will come along to knock it off its throne, right? But in heaven, nothing will interrupt the joy that we have. In fact, I'm practicing smiling a lot because, I, you know, that's, we're going to have a big smile up there. At all times, your face is going to hurt, although it's not going to hurt because there's no pain in heaven. So you need to surrender. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. Give up your own way. That's surrender. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up 
your life for my sake, you will save it. Transformation comes through obedience to God's word. No obedience, no transformation. Jesus' prayer uh, for all the believers in John chapter 17, he said this, uh, praying to the Father for the believers, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is the truth. The truth is transformational, but it's transformational, transformational when you obey it, right? If you have the truth, but you don't obey the truth, there's no transformation. It's when you put the word in action that you are transformed. I'm going to say amen. Transformation occurs through desiring it. Do you want to change? Do you have a desire to leave those things behind? Or do you still have a secret allure to some of the things that you came out of? The Bible says if you love the world or anything in the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You have to make a choice of what you're going to love. Amen? Do you want to change? Because that's what it takes. You have to have a desire to be different, not to stay the same way. I'm not satisfied with where I am. I want to be able to pull up to a car that lets the light turn red, and I say, praise God for that, brother. I can hear this sermon I'm listening to for a little while longer. <laughs> it might take me a while, but I want to get there. Transformation occurs through an intimate relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you, if you develop through prayer and his word and being around the people of God, an intimate relationship with Jesus, guess what's going to happen? You're going to change. It's just like hanging with anybody else. Hang out with some wrong characters, and let me tell you what will happen. You know what will happen, don't you? So many people get in trouble that way. The Bible says bad company corrupts good morals. You know, uh, when I was uh, recording, I'm a bass player, and I used to play for this big choir, and we used to travel all around, and, and when we would uh, record, the, the band would go to Nashville. Back then, that's where you go to record. They had all these studios. So we'd be in Nashville for seven days or something like that for a week. And you know the people in Nashville, they speak funny. You know, they don't change the tire, they change the tar. <laughs> and so, you know, they talk with that twang, you know, from, uh, from, 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 from the Wild West. And, and so then when I would come back <laughs> from this trip, here's a Puerto Rican from Brooklyn, and he's talking like he's from the South. You know, and I'd, I'd catch myself, what, what am I doing? I was there for seven days, and I'm talking like I, I was born in the South. Ridiculous. Thank God I don't talk with a, a Brooklyn. I don't have a Brooklyn accent, do I? I don't. I'm telling myself that I don't. But if you hang around something, you're going to get stuff from that person. You're going to... You ever hang around someone and someone has a phrase and then you start saying it all, you start saying it as well? Well, when you hang around Jesus and you have an intimate relationship with Jesus, you start coming like Jesus. How many say amen? amen. You, you, you're waned away from your worship of self, of pleasure in the world, and you become more like Jesus. And finally, let me close with saying this, that transformation is brought about by you and the Holy Spirit. It's not just you. So is it you that changes or transforms, or is it the Holy Spirit that does it? Which is it? Because I always thought it was God. God has to do the change. How many can change by yourself? We've all tried that, right? I love, uh, you know, I used to laugh at, you know, some of the places where they send you, if you have an anger problem, like waiting behind cars and you have an anger problem, they send, you might send you to anger management classes, right, to manage your anger. And so what they teach you is things that uh, control outward behavior. But what they can't teach you is how to change from the inside out. So, you know, I'm thinking as someone's going to anger management, uh, lots of luck with that, because unless you're changed from the inside out, there's not going to be any real change. So who does change? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it you? It's both, you see, because the Holy Spirit will never work change in you if you are unwilling or if you don't even want to make an effort. 
He's going to help you, but only with your cooperation. It's a partnership. You see, Jesus comes to live in you. It's just like a good marriage. A good marriage is a partnership. You join forces together. The two become one. A good team is a partnership where everybody cooperates for the greater good. Isn't that how a team wins? If you get selfish players and and throw them on a team, they'll never win anything. One guy might score 50, but you're going to lose the game. So it takes cooperation. And Jesus means to come in and he'll partner with you. But I got to say this, he's in charge. He tells you and me what needs to be done. I want to read you some scripture, scripture, and I'm going to end with it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13 says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, who's doing that? The Apostle Paul, is take, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling the Christians at Philippi to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's their part. They're going to continue to work on it and to do their best to uh, grow and work on their salvation. And then the following verse says this, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So you work on it, but it's God in you to work according to his good will and purpose. Do you understand? Let me read it to you another way from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 and 23. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, here's our part, throw off your old sinful nature And your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. So what's our part? Throw off, leave behind, walk away from the old life that you used to live in. That's your part. And here comes God's part. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. So you walk away, that's your part. Then the Spirit, with your cooperation, now begins to renew your mind, your heart, the way you do things. He starts to do his beautiful work, which, by the way, you can't do and I can't do. But if we're not engaged with him, he does not force his will or transformation on anybody. It is with your will intact, laying down to the will of God for your life. It is always the Holy Spirit that makes the change. But we need to agree with him to see that change happen. I don't know about you, but I, I want more. I want more. I don't want to be ordinary. I don't want to be impatient. I, I don't want to waste the rest of my life on my own selfish desires and pleasures. I never got anything out of that. I want to do the greatest amount of good I can on this earth with the time that I have left. And I can only do that as he continues to transform me so I can look more and more like him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. You know, I began by saying that there needs to be an initial change, an initial transformation, and that comes from receiving Christ into your heart. That starts the process, and that's a huge a huge thing that happens, and it happens this way, again, with your permission, by you asking the Lord to come into your life and asking him to forgive your sins so that uh, you can begin on a brand new slate. And if there's someone here who uh, the Lord is speaking to and you want to surrender your life, maybe you haven't done it before, or maybe you did and got choked out and and now you're back. And you want to say, Lord, I surrender to you today. I want to receive you into my life. Is there someone like that? If you would raise your hand, I want to pray with you. 
If there's someone in the building that needs to make that decision, yes, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. Anybody else before we pray? You know, uh, the, the presence of the Lord is here, and those of you that raise your hand, God wants to do something so new in your life. And I believe with all my heart because I've just seen so much, uh, so many changed lives, mine included, that I have so much hope that right now as you pray, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to repeat it, make it your prayer that God is going to make that transaction with you. If you raise your hand, say these words after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your mercy and grace. Lord, I believe that you are the son of the living God. And I believe you died on the cross and rose on the third day. All of that I believe. Today, Lord, I confess that I've done many things wrong and I'm sorry. Forgive my sin today. Lord, your word says according to your own word. Lord, when I do that, you forgive me and I thank you for that. Lord, come into my heart and my life. And begin, Lord, that transformation process that I need. I can't do it by myself, Lord. I need you. Teach me and show me. But right now, I receive you into my heart. In Jesus' name. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for those, Lord God, that have, Lord, invited you in right now, whatever the situation is in their life. And I pray, Father, that that beautiful process of transformation, God, will begin in their life, oh God. Thank you, Lord, that no matter where we are or what has happened or what we've done, Lord, once we make that transaction, all that, Father, you, Lord, just erase it from our lives. And you say that we're brand new. And I thank you and I praise you, God, for brand new lives here today. And God, I pray that for your keeping power now, God, that this will be it, Father. There will be no straying but, Lord, a transformation process to make each person look like Jesus. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. For the rest of us, which are, with our heads bowed and eyes still closed, if there's some of you that maybe uh, you got interrupted a little bit or you want more of God and you, you haven't seen the change that you want to see, you have a desire today, or God has put a desire in your heart for more transformation you're following Christ, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray over you today. Yes, I see your hands all over the building. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for speaking to your people today, Lord God. And Lord, I, we confess together, God, that we need you, Lord. We, we do not have what it takes to even want or have the desire to change. We need you, Father, to touch our hearts, oh God. So God, I pray that you would keep your people, oh God, that you would give us a strong desire, God, to serve you with all of our hearts so that nothing, God, will impede, God, our process of transforming and becoming more and more like you. Whatever it is that's keeping, Lord God, your people back, Lord God, I come against it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, so that, Lord, we can see your blessing on each person, oh God. Lord, there is nothing that can come against us. Your word says that no weapon formed against us can prosper. God, the only weapons that can prosper are the ones that we allow into our lives, oh God. But today, God, we renounce everything that's not of you, Lord Jesus. God, and we receive, oh God, your plan into our life, oh God, your way and your will, Lord Jesus. Help us, we pray. We thank you, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand and give God glory?